Hello, I'm Ian Dale. I present the evening show on LBC and contribute to various BBC programmes on the BBC. And um, I host the For the Many podcast. Now, this is the latest in a series of online debates sparked by the publication of the book, Is the BBC in Peril? Does it deserve to be? Published in April and edited by John Mayer and Tom Bradshaw, in which I have written an essay. Now, there's an incentive to buy it. Now, the BBC began the year facing a government which made little secret of it to reform the BBC and its method of funding. Uh, as is usual with governments of any colour, there were constant battles with the News and Current Affairs Department over accusations of bias and programme formats, resulting in various programmes being boycotted by government ministers. Now, these boycotts also extended to other broadcasters. The government won an election on a manifesto which said it would decriminalise licence fee evasion. The BBC faces huge financial costs over free TV for almost 4 million over 75s. But this commitment has resulted in massive cuts, not least in the news and current affairs departments, including 450 possible job losses. But come coronavirus, the broadcasting changed as much as the real world. Suddenly, the BBC was at the forefront as government ministers daily subject themselves to interviews. Local radio plays an increasingly vital part in serving local communities. Trust in BBC News remains higher than other broadcasters, yet still languishes below 50%, according to recent polls. The BBC has adapted its daily programmes, covering education at home, fitness sessions, entertainment for small children, and easy-to-cook recipes online. Haven't availed myself of that one yet. Now, alongside public service announcements, it ran a controversial panorama which sought to expose government failings over pandemic planning, but which drew heavy criticism for only interviewing NHS and scientific representatives who had a background of left wing activism. The corporation was unapologetic in the face of fierce criticism of lack of impartiality from the government and right of centre commentators. Now, the BBC has a revenue of £3.7 billion from the licence fee and an additional billion from commercial activities, supporting 20,000 employees. The weekly reach among over 55 is 92%. The biggest drop comes in audiences aged between 16 and 34, down from 60% to 56% and watching for less time iPlayer requests rose to 3.6 billion, but there's increasing competition from internet delivered television. Netflix subscriptions have increased 10% globally in the last quarter, and Disney Plus has hit 55 million subscribers worldwide in under six months. In the first three weeks of lockdown, the BBC saw viewer numbers increase by 23%, with more than a third of all television viewing on the corporation's platform. My name is Fiona Chesterton and I have an interest to declare. I worked in public service broadcasting as a producer, news editor and commissioning editor for all of my career, mainly at the BBC and Channel 4. I'd now describe myself as a critical friend of both. So after sending congratulations to the new DG, this is what I'd urge on him or her. Firstly, get on the front foot, preferably in running shoes. Do not be lulled into a false sense of security by what seems to be the BBC's renewed central place in the life of a nation at war. I suggest that despite appearances, nothing has changed, as the late, not very lamented Mrs May used to say. Nothing has changed in terms of the strategic challenges facing the BBC. I'll not list them all, but here are a few. One, loss of trust by a significant but persistent minority of the population in the impartiality of the BBC's journalism. Note the response by them and by the government to the recent panorama on PPE. This minority includes many older people whose loyalty you must not take for granted. Two, entrenched political hostility supported by that persistent and vocal minority to the continuation of licence fee. Three, Substantial and continuing loss of audiences, especially among the young. Four, well-funded international competition, notably from the streaming services, whose growth continues and who are driving up budgets and audience expectations for drama and documentaries aimed at all audiences, not just the young. 
increasing reliance on independent production for creative innovation, excellence, and key talent, which may take their services elsewhere, including to those well-funded international competitors. An urgent need to broaden and grow the BBC's revenue base to sustain its journalism and non-news programming after years of cuts. So, I hope you have a plan. A plan you can get out and sell, not so much to the usual suspects, the politicians, the policy wants, and those who may still be called the opinion formers, in other words, the metropolitan elite. It's vital, I would suggest, to communicate directly to the license fee payers and win back trust and loyalty. Get out there. I'd suggest your plan should include a bold gesture to recognize that one thing has changed because of coronavirus. Millions of those license fee payers will be significantly poorer in the coming few years. Paying for their entertainment and information is going to come lower in the priority list than paying the rent and putting food on the table. How about offering to freeze the license fee for three years, cut executive pay by say 10% and start to build the future with a subscription channel aimed at the international as well as domestic audience. His first view premier drama and documentaries called perhaps BBC Premier. This might include some material that might have gone on to BBC Four, which I see your predecessor might be minded to close. I'd pay 10 pounds, perhaps as much as 20 pounds a month for that. And I bet a lot of other people would too. <laughs> That's Fiona Chesterton there setting the scene for our debate. Let me remind you of the title of the debate. Is the BBC still in peril? An agenda for the new director general. Well, let me introduce my panel. They're each going to speak for four minutes. Then they'll be cross-examined by me and the other three panellists. Um, and we're going to kick off with Roger Mosey, Master of Selwyn College, Cambridge. Um, he was head of BBC Television News and controller of Five Live. Uh, Edwina Curry, former Conservative MP and Health Minister, and also used to be a presenter on Radio 5 Live. Um, Mark Damazer, Master at St Peter's College, Oxford. I don't know if it's obligatory to become a Master of a College after you leave the BBC, but um, Mark was also, of course, controller of Radio 4 for many years. Liam Halligan, um, an economist, former economics editor at Channel 4 News, my co-panellist on CNN Talk, and also now a columnist for the Sunday Telegraph. Well, Roger Mosey is going to start four minutes and then we'll have some questions to Roger. So kick us off, Roger. Well, the question is, is the BBC in peril? And the clear answer is, yes, it is. And I agree with a lot of what Fiona said. And that's partly because of the way the media landscape has changed with such intense competition from the global giants to Bert in a shed with a laptop. Um, it's partly because of the financial crisis, which will make the BBC's position even shakier. And clearly it has a government which is not particularly sympathetic. But I am completely convinced that Britain and indeed the wider world need the BBC more than ever. And public service broadcasting is at the heart of keeping our country informed and cohesive. Now, I, I say this as someone who's sometimes been critical of the BBC, and there have been times when uh, neither Mark Damazer nor I have been the favourites of the corporate press office. So I think I should put two things on the table from the start. The first is the BBC has not always got it right strategically in recent years. Just two examples. It shouldn't have done the licence fee deal it did in 2015, and it shouldn't have got rid of BBC Three as a TV channel because that made its problem with younger audiences worse. It also sometimes hasn't been strong enough editorially. Um, I thought, for instance, it had rather a poor Brexit and a mediocre election campaign in 2019, and it does sometimes fall into the, the traps laid by the Westminster metropolitan bubble. But I say that not because, as some here today do, because I want to get rid of the BBC, but because I want it to be better. I want it to be vigorous and strong and dynamic and challenging, and I hope that's top of the agenda for the new DG. And as Ian said, in these terrible circumstances of the health emergency, the BBC has proven its worth in recent months. And what I and many others talked about at the time was the need for the corporation to rediscover old time religion. What we mean is the kind of unambiguous public service broadcasting that's been doing during the coronavirus crisis. And let me just reinforce some of those um, mentioned by Ian, but they've all happened because of the BBC and not because of some sort of magic fairy dust that makes it happen. 
The BBC has been the place where audiences, including younger people, came for news and information. And in pretty much all the surveys and research I've seen, the trust levels remain impressively high. A lack of trust is inevitable in an age of social media. And actually, I sometimes think the BBC should pay less rather than more attention to its critics on Twitter. It's interesting, for instance, that before this crisis, some politicians were saying that Netflix could meet the nation's need for quality content, and there haven't been that many sightings of Netflix news reporters covering coronavirus. The VE Day coverage, brilliant, I thought. High quality in difficult circumstances, and it really brought the nation together. Even Rod Little loved it. And that fits into a pattern of the BBC being the place where people join for the big night in or children in need, as they do for big sports events, the Olympics and World Cup and all the rest of it. And if any of those from Wimbledon to the proms to Glastonbury were bunged behind paywalls and only available to people who could afford it, we would all be worse off. And this is the other question for the BBC's critics. Why, more than three decades after the launch of Sky and with its massive profitability, why isn't Sky the place where people want to join together in their tens of millions? No other broadcaster is making the education offer that the BBC is doing. Bite size, all the riches of the archive, all those boons to parents who are currently homeschooling. And listen to local radio too. And this year it guided and kept communities safe through the floods, now through a health emergency, and it's often a lifeline for lonely elderly people who want to keep in touch with those nearby. And it's something that commercial radio has largely abandoned. And breakfast shows on commercial radio, often produced in one city and broadcast to another, or the Heart Network just being whacked around the country with just a few local ads in it. So there is immense strength and vitality left in public service broadcasting and in the BBC. But I do accept, uh, just coming towards winding up, it does need to change. Um, the country, the public, the BBC need to decide what size it should be, what services it should provide. The licence fee has often been the least worst way of funding the BBC, but I accept it may be archaic. There may be other ways the BBC should be funded. And I think the BBC needs new editorial energy and a fresh vision of what it can do. So change, certainly. But if the BBC was shot to the margins, we would all be very much poorer. Let me kick off with a question, Roger. If you were the incoming DG, what would be the most urgent thing in your intray? What would you want to get to grips with on day one? I think you need to get to grips with the government about the size and shape and financing of the BBC. And um, it has very generously at the moment forgone the over 75 licence fees during the coronavirus crisis. But I, I gather it's costing about £40 million a month and the pressure on BBC services is going to become immense. So I think the question of what size do you want the BBC to do and what services should it provide is essential. And my, my own view is that, um, you know, the, the, the NHS parallel is, is coming through during this crisis. And you, you need the NHS there for everybody when they need it. You don't necessarily need it for providing something every single day for everybody. And I, I, I would look at whether the BBC can really go for distinctiveness, true public service, a sense that it's there when the country needs it, as it is now. And if that means that it's slightly smaller in some areas, fine. But shouldn't it be up to the BBC to go to the government and say, right, this is our vision for the future. This is how we think we should be funded. These are the areas that we think we should continue with and expand. And these are the areas that we accept that maybe, OK, we should withdraw from. Surely they need to be on the front foot, because at the moment, my impression is they're, they're just waiting for the government to suggest things. Yeah, I, I, th I think the BBC needs to be on the front foot and the new DG will come with a fresh editorial vision. And um, I think it would be a mistake to make that vision something bigger. Um, I think you have to recognise that the current method of paying for licence fee and the current level of licence fee is problematic in an age when many younger audiences don't habitually use the BBC. So you have to address all those issues. But guaranteeing that the BBC exists and is doing the things which keep our civic realm together is non-negotiable. Liam Halligan, uh, do you have a question for Roger? Can someone unmute Liam? Okay, well, let, let's let's leave Liam to one side. So, of my sorry, sorry, and I'm here. Um, okay, start, great. What's I, the question? I, I start off by saying that I'd recommend to everyone on this podcast 
um, Roger's book, Getting Out Alive. It's a, a fabulously well-written and honest insider's account of his life and times at, at the BBC. So I, I'd put that out there. I'd say, I'd ask Roger, um, how did you feel watching the BBC's coverage during not so much the Brexit referendum, where, as I, I'll say, I, I think the BBC did relatively well, but during this sort of period of parliamentary shenanigans, if you like, when John Burko was, uh, was ruling the roost? Well, I think there are problems in all political reporting in the, in the UK. And I think the, the Westminster bubble loves focusing on who's up, who's down, and what the process questions are. And often you lose that long-term sense of what are the policies that are right for the country. And I, I would say that um, there was too little attention paid at times to the things really happening in the country. Um, you can get wrapped up in this London world in which you don't really recognise what's happening in Sunderland. Um, and, and equally, uh, you have to recognise that decisions being taken, those parliamentary processes are actually about our long-term security and prosperity. I don't think that was always connected. It was too much within the chamber of the House of Commons and the people just outside it. Do you think it was just normal Westminster bubble behaviour, though, or do you think it was a particularly uh, noteworthy period in terms of the BBC's coverage of a, of a national event? Well, I don't think the BBC was any any worse than anybody else. I mean, my my criticism in a way of the BBC at the time was it was like Not everyone else. pays for other broadcasters. Everyone well, pays. Well, that's right. It, it was like everybody else, and I think it should have been better. So I I, I, I am critical of aspects of the political coverage in recent years. And I, I think Mark probably is too. But, 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 but really fixing that is something which you can do. I think the BBC could fix its politics coverage relatively simply. Um, and in that case, the case for the BBC remains strong. So as I say, I don't want to destroy the BBC. I want it to be stronger and better. Okay, Liam, thank you very much. I should, you, um, as a declaration of interest, say that I've published three of our contributors today. I'll leave everyone to guess which one I haven't published. Um, Edwina Curry, would you like to ask Roger a question? Uh, me, uh, there we go. Um, I'm not sure about asking Roger um, a, a, a question. Uh, let me just ask you to extemporise a little bit further. Uh, you pointed out that the, v, uh, the, um, the VE Day coverage was excellent, right? Now, why do you think it was excellent? What do you think it was about that that made it such a compelling piece of viewing? And of course, the other side of that is why on earth isn't there more like that? Well, it was brilliantly produced. Um, it's also those times when the BBC speaks for the nation and uh, that's what a public service broadcaster should aspire to do. It's harder to do on the Brexit debate because you're speaking for a very divided nation, whereas on VE Day, um, the, the mix of generations and the history and the current celebrations, it's, it's, a, it's a less controversial area to cover. But I, I thought the standard of production and reporting was extraordinarily high. And again, I think only the BBC could have done that. Right. Um, Mark, I'm not going to ask you to ask your former colleague a question because for each one, I'm going to ask the two opponents to, to quiz them. Um, but Edwina, would you like to uh, regale us with your thoughts on the future of the BBC? Do you think it's in peril? No, I don't think the BBC is in peril. But my advice to the new director general, whoever she is, uh, would be to... <laughs> would be to think uh, long and hard about how, how to go forward. I mean, much of the argument that we've heard has been based on the BBC as a public sector broadcaster, particularly of news and of current affairs. Actually, most of the coverage of the BBC is entertainment. Um, and I say that as a former participant in Strictly Come Dancing. All right. Um, if, that that's, entertainment? if that's the case, if the case is going to be based on public service broadcasting, and news, then there is no argument whatever for axing 450 jobs from news and from cutting 80 million from its budget. That should go from somewhere else. I don't care where, but uh, if, if that matters, it's a, a very significant part of what uh, the BBC is all about. There are lots of other news services. Some of them have shown themselves to be very nimble and effective uh, right through this crisis and more recently. On radio, LBC has changed dramatically uh, in recent years. I'm not just saying that because of you, Ian, um, and Sky as well. And bear in mind that um, Sky in this household costs us 
uh, more every month than the entire license fee, and we willingly pay it. Uh, they, their coverage is, is, is ex exceptional, and we can thereby access many things that we want to see. So the, the, we've also got to bear in mind that the newspapers are also adapting, and uh, much of the best news and comments from, comes from newspapers online, like The Telegraph uh, and uh, many others. Plus, if you really want to maintain this line, I would say to the new DG, then the BBC needs to do a serious critique of its work uh, in news. Let, let me just give you uh, several examples. First of all, the coverage of business is dire. You know, it's almost as if the only thing that matters is people who are in the public sector. And actually most people in this country are employed in the private sector, uh, in business of various kinds. If I want to find out what's going on in business, I have to watch Bloomberg um, or CNN or one of the others. Uh, or have a look at the Telegraph business pages online or, you know, the, the, the sources of news about business are not the BBC. It's, hard, it's virtually non-existent. And when it is done, it's done in a twee slightly, you know, oh, in the factory. Um, oh, look, biscuits. And you think, for God's sake, this is ridiculous in a modern world. And it helps to fuel the idea that actually both business doesn't matter and profits don't matter. And uh, it's only taxpayers that are paying for things. All right, that's one. A second bit of coverage that you need to improve is older people. Ah, you know what? There's 9 million people aged 70 or over as nation now realize, 15 million retired people. Your coverage of us is awful. Uh, you only ever see older people on TV when we're decrepit or we're in hospital, or we're in a care home. You never ever see on the BBC the wonderful things that we all get up to. ITV did this better with Last Tango in Halifax. And, you know, somewhere along the line, you're missing out millions and millions and millions of, of people, including those who are watching you. Um, the third thing is our Brexit. Look, the, I, I accept the Brexit was a very divisive debate, but there was a large chunk of that debate that was not on the BBC. And living where I do in the north of England, you heard it all the time. That's why the BBC was so surprised on election night in December 2019, when the Tories romped home, particularly in the north of England. And what that tells you is you've been doing groupthink in a way that is actually very damaging to your reputation, but also very damaging to your own knowledge as news creators and broadcasters. Uh, it, it, there, that's why the government's so cross with you. And that's why the government put in the manifesto and won on that basis uh, that the license fee is going to be decriminalized and that's gonna cost about 200 million. You dare take that out of news and you destroy your own, uh, your own uh, basis of the argument. Uh, the whole thing is, it, it seems to me from where I sit as a 70 year old Northern Former scientists, so that's the other thing you don't do. You hardly ever do science on TV. You do it on radio. Radio 4 does it extremely well with Life Scientific and um, uh, more or less. Okay, and so I, I need you to wrap up really Yeah. But, um, you know, as a 73-year-old Northern former scientist, economist, and a now convinced Brexiteer, I am sick of being sneered at by the BBC. You want my money, you're going to have to justify it. And that means a change a change in the way that you approach it and the way that you seek to broadcast to people like me and the way you seek to report the nation as a whole. Okay, um, Edwina, thank you for that. I'll come to Mark Damaser for a question in just a moment, but you, you talked about the fact that we all willingly pay whatever it is for our Sky subscriptions. I think with my Sky Sports, it's, it's, it's like about 89 pounds a month, something like that, way, way, way above what we pay for the BBC. Now we can all afford to pay for the BBC and no doubt we all would if, if it was subscription. But what about those people who just wouldn't? The fact that the BBC would then surely not be the nation's national broadcaster anymore because it were, there would be quite a few million people who just wouldn't bother. So? I mean, in the end, you have to say so. There is no um, absolute guarantee that the BBC can continue in the way that it, that it has done. Uh, it's about, to, in another couple of years, it'll celebrate its 100th birthday. The next 100 years are bound to be very, very different. And that's coming up on you without you realizing um, that particular, you know, somewhere along the line, you have to adapt to the fact that increasingly people are going to be getting their broadcasting 
from something like this. And so the argument that says you have to pay if you're sitting on a sofa watching a TV uh, is getting weaker all the time. Uh, these issues have affected retailing. Uh, they affect a whole host of, uh, of other aspects of national life. Uh, the BBC has no God given right to exist. It has to justify itself okay. and it has to adapt. Right, let's bring in Mark Damaso for a question. Mark, go ahead. Um, Edwina, forgive me, I, I had to do one factual correction. Last Tango in Halifax is a, a BBC um, production. Um, uh, yeah, but it's not on the BBC. Uh, it's not it, on the BBC. I, I was on the BBC for several years. Um, put that to one side. Um, do you think that your former constituents who pay for the BBC would want the BBC to do comedy programmes? Do you think they do would comedy programmes? Yeah. On telly. Well, Fleabag, Rev, Office, all the way back to Monty Python, you name it. I mean, the BBC has a long and proud tradition of making rather distinguished programmes in comedy based on British talent. That's extremely expensive. And if I share your taste for news and current affairs, and we imagine a world with a reduced licence fee or a frozen licence fee, would you cut comedy? Uh, you're asking, offer me the job as, a, uh, as the uh, Director General, that would be well, you're, very... You're, you're the Director General, and you said um, that you were fairly relaxed about what got cut, just things should get cut. And the point is, I've got lots of things on the BBC I can't abide and pay good money not to watch. Uh, and there are plenty of them, and there are plenty of others that I pay money to watch. And I'm just interested to know that if you take the plurality of the United Kingdom, where tastes are hugely varied and eclectic, which particular group do you think is the group that you're most likely to feel don't deserve to have these programmes anymore? Well, I would turn the question the other way around. If the BBC uh, really had to start to think in a, a much more national, a much more commercial way and think hard about its, its customers, the people who are paying for it, uh, and if they had more of a choice, what would the BBC be providing? Now, from the argument we've had so far, it would be news. It would be news and coverage and, and public service, and we would all be extremely willing to pay for that. After that, it's a question of, I think choosing certain channel, uh, channels. The, the programs you mentioned in comedy, for example, I have never watched and I never want to watch. No, no, no. I mean, I, I absolutely understand that there are loads of things that you don't like and our differences would be completely, as it were, hugely different between even us, a constituency of uh, five or six privileged people. I'm just thinking about the UK as a whole. It's quite easy to say the BBC is doing too much until you actually begin to cut. And then you find all kinds of people, including your former constituencies, are incredibly offended. The BBC once cut a programme about shepherds and sheepdogs. There was a riot. Every time the BBC tries to cut something, Six Music, um, a rather distinguished director general, thought, let's get rid of Six Music, small channel, who cares? The next thing that happened was a huge petition, and the Board of Governors decided they couldn't possibly cut Six Music because its commitment to original commissioning and new British bands and British talent meant that it was terrific. It's always easier to say, don't, 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 um, rather than do, do, do. And then you have to say, well, what is the total cost of the enterprise? So for all of these things, which many of your constituents adore, others, I dare say, would hate, bundled together, you pay about 36p a day. Good value or bad value? Well, but the answer to that would be, if you carry on in that frame of mind, uh, you will end up with something costing far more than you've got to spend. That's yes, course, yeah. the, Mark, Mark, let yeah. me answer your question. That's the job of management, right? The BBC bosses are not elected. They are appointed. They're paid a king's ransom, and they're supposed to be extremely good at management, right? And that's the kind of choices that they make all the time. Uh, some of the choices that you've mentioned actually didn't exist before. For example, the BBC never used to make programmes for other channels, and they do now, and they make money out of it. Uh, the BBC never used to make the fortune that it makes now selling uh, programmes to other countries. Uh, the BBC has been very slow off the mark in getting onto a really good uh, internet, and hey presto, next thing we know, it's cutting it. It's um, the biggest website. I mean, the news website is one of right. the roaring successes. We, 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 are, we are starting to run behind schedule a minute. So, um, Roger Mosey, have you got a quick question? And let's have a quick answer as well. Uh, it's, it's a quick observation, really. I'd, I'd add to the list. I very, very much believe in the BBC doing drama. 
And uh, I think if you're watching normal people at the moment, um, it's extraordinary and something which I really don't think that kind of piece would sit very easily on any other channel, any other broadcaster. So um, I, I would support Mark in comedy being important, but drama very important, especially in cutting through as Britain's creativity in the wider world. Uh, yes, by all means, but then the, there are other ways of doing that as well. I'm not saying that there should be only news, but I'm answering Mark's point that if you, if you try and cut anything, somebody objects, and that's what management's for. Management's gonna to have to decide, it needs to look to the future. It needs to think about who it wants to attract and why and how. It is actually possible to survive solely on subscriptions. It is possible to survive on a mixture of subscriptions, a license fee decriminalized, uh, is selling a lot more services abroad, which can be used with adverts uh, and uh, exporting uh, business. But it needs to have a business mind in there. It's no wonder you haven't got a business mind. You never cover business. You don't know the first thing about it or how to run a profitable or at least a break even organization. All you can do is hold out your hand and expect the government to send the police to ensure that that money's paid. And then you can't carry on like that. Right. Can we carry on like that? Mark Damaza, what, uh, how would you answer the question, is the BBC in peril? Uh, the BBC is always in peril. It's probably more in peril now than it looks because of COVID, and it's probably more in peril than it's been for most of its distinguished history. Uh, and it's partly technology and consumer behaviour, and it's partly politics and political pressure, and it's partly competition. Uh, I'm a passionate, indeed religious believer in the BBC, but several things can be true at the same time. One is that the BBC uh, is uh, less powerful than it used to be. Uh, two, it will continue to be less powerful than it used to be. And three, nevertheless, it constitutes a fantastic bargain. Uh, and it's one of the best things about British public life. It's not to be confused with the NHS. It's nowhere near as important as the NHS. Uh, it wasn't pre-COVID and it won't be after COVID. But nevertheless, it's one of those aspects of the public realm that functions remarkably well. And I don't want to rest my case for the defense on its performance during COVID, which Roger and Ian, you generously remarked on in the front. We'll come back to that if we need to. And I think that they've been predictably extremely good. My case really rests on what the BBC was like before COVID and the difficulty, which is the burden of my questions towards Edwina of coming up with alternative models that look very attractive for the first and second paragraph and then crumble by the time you get to the third or fourth paragraph. So having said that the BBC uh, is less important in public life a little bit than it used to be, you then come to what the consumption was before COVID broke and the consumption is absolutely remarkable still. Reach is well above 90%, probably 92, 93%. Uh, and what is the average consumption of all of these people who grumble about the BBC because they own it and who feel tetchy about the BBC when it lets them down and who protest about the BBC when it doesn't do the programmes they want? What is their average consumption? 18 hours, this is before COVID, 18 hours per adult per week, which doesn't account for the people who are watching BBC children's programmes, point they're not like other children's programs because they don't rely on animated cartoons. So what is the BBC? It's an amalgam of history uh, and talent and distribution mechanisms designed to appeal to all audiences with programs that give everybody at least something of quality. Does it always succeed? Certainly not. Does it sometimes fail ingloriously? Certainly yes. Does it broadly hit the mark? Yes. If you look at the range of activities that the BBC is involved in, still extremely large, music commissioning, drama, comedy, regions, nations, news, current affairs, religion, science, and on and on and on it goes, all based on the notion of British culture and British talent. And a British culture, incidentally, that is broadly defined and internationalist in outlook. And it is very, very hard to replicate. I'm sure the nation would continue as it were to exist and the world would spin on its axis if the BBC didn't exist. But for the princely sum um, of three pounds and a bit a week, you get all of this bundled up together and you start smashing it apart and you'll find that it becomes instantly more expensive because the bundle of things that Edwina would want to pay for or Ian, you would want to pay for or Liam would want to pay for in one household 
if you start having to pay for them separately and a little bit of license for the market failure stuff, you know, Radio 3 and Radio 4 and using current affairs, it will very, very rapidly become a much more extensive proposition than it is now. And I conclude with this thought, there is something absolutely noble about the idea of public service broadcasting that foregrounds the notion of a citizen as opposed to a consumer, that we all own it, that we can all grumble about it, and that we can all sometimes absolutely feel that it is doing an atrocious job. And why do we feel that so passionately? Because it's ours and because it's not the state's and because it's not the government's. And why does it continue to work? Because it's got a huge number of talented people who still believe in it and make programs for its many audiences imperfectly as it might, and because it hangs on to a notion of quality and does it for an incredible bargain. Um, we haven't talked a lot about radio in this discussion so far. We all have a mutual love of radio. Um, and radio listeners are very conservative beasts and with a, with a small c. They do not like change. Now, should the BBC, do you think, Mark, continue running all of the radio stations that it does? It, it's, it's effectively created 20 new radio stations, sort of podcasty things, spin-offs from existing stations over the last few months. You think, well, is that a good use of licence payers' money? I mean, radio is incredibly cheap. And the cost per listener hour of even the most recherche radio you can find, as it were, Radio 3, love it as I do, is still absolutely peanuts compared to television. So in fact, when Mark Thompson tried to cut Six Music, I think it was much as political as an economic act. You weren't really gonna save much money. Um, uh, there was a point when I was doing Radio 4 and was in touch with the radio industry more than I am now, where the BBC was extremely anxious about its muscle power vis-a-vis -vis commercial radio. And commercial radio appeared to be in the doldrums, open brackets, because they had invested so chronically little in programming over the previous 20 years. Wow and their offer was thinner and thinner and thinner. And the BBC, with its privilege license fee, and it is a privilege, had invested very heavily in radio by comparison. Should the BBC cut things? I mean, it just gets back to the Edwina point. I agree with her. It's management's job to make these trade-offs between entertainment and drama and religion and science and television, news and current affairs, and they shouldn't hide from it. What I was suggesting was it's a damn sight more difficult because there are so many people who still hold on to the idea that the BBC provides them with programming they really adore in all of these different genres and not just the market failure ones and not just news and current affairs. So the answer, Ian, is that I would be open to it if there were radio stations which looked as if they didn't have much of a future and much of an audience, but it doesn't save you any money or too little in the larger scheme of things. I've been asked to ask you all to speak a little bit more loudly, which uh, for people in broadcasting shouldn't be too much of a problem. <laughs> Liam, you've got a loud voice. Um, ask, ask Mark your loud question. Me, Ian. Yes. Thank you. Um, Mark, do you accept that there does need to be some change to the way the BBC is funded? And yeah. you predict with all your experience uh, and hope for the BBC's health, hope which I must say, and you'll hear in my remarks in a moment, I absolutely share with you. Do you think that the licence fee by the time it comes to 2027 should be bigger in real terms now than it is or smaller? Uh, so I don't think the licence fee, I think um, there are other ways of funding and I think the licence fee is problematic. And um, we can go into the reasons why. There are other public service broadcasters in Europe who find different ways of getting a revenue and income related to taxation. So I'm still in favor of everybody paying for it broadly, because I think it's the universe, universality that gives you the range, the breadth and the quality and so on and so forth. But I wouldn't go for a license fee. Now, what should it be? Now we come back to the idea that Ian, you've all floated, which is what would the subscription model look like and what would other revenue streams look like? So if I were the incoming director general, would I have the cleverest people that I can find trying to work on what other revenue streams would look like? Absolutely. What kind of partnerships could the BBC form that wouldn't contaminate its editorial integrity or its notion of making programmes based on British talent for British audience for that equivalent of a licence fee? I would certainly be looking at that. Um, subscription is remarkably hard. You start taking something away from people who are only paying £3.50 a week and start asking to pay a premium. I could afford it, Fiona could afford it, you could all afford it, but some of your constituents in Edwina's case will go up the wall. So it's very difficult. However, to get to Liam's question, I acknowledge that it will be very hard uh, to have a real terms increase 
uh, in whatever the mechanism is. Uh, I would probably think that getting it flat in real terms is a result and then adding to the revenue by using other revenue streams. Thank you. Edwina. Yes, well, in fact, that's that's the direction the BBC has been going in, isn't it, Mark, now for some time? Uh, that That's how the thinking is. Um, it, it, are you not making an assumption, however, that there has to be one BBC? I mean, if you look at something like Sky, there are lots of packages. Ian pays an awful lot less for his Sky than we do, because my husband insists on having every single sports channel that there is. Not that he watches them very much. And we have broadband and we have all the rest of that uh, as well. Uh, what the commercial uh, operators have figured out is that you can offer choices and that people will put together packages to suit them. So the basic package might well be the public service broadcasting part. But there's nothing public service broadcasting about Strictly Come Dancing. Do you see well, what I'm getting um, at? And the people yeah, will put no. choices that yeah. suit them. Yeah, so I mean, Edwina, uh, uh, briefly, because your model is a popular one and clearly it's going to have to be considered. I don't agree with it, but I'll consider it in a minute. I just want to say one thing because I haven't had the chance to. My defence of the BBC and my religious belief in it is not based on the fact that everybody is inferior and it's the only thing that counts. And I think Sky News over decades has done an extremely good job, as LBC does now. Um, look, I think the point is this. You get a household with various tastes, never mind about a constituency or a nation. And you've got somebody in the household who really wants children's programs, um, uh, both the children and the people looking after the children. You've got somebody else in the house who really wants the BBC's news and current affairs. You've got somebody else who really likes Match of the Day. And you have somebody else who really likes Radio 2. That would be a kind of conventional house. But across Britain, there would be 40 million variants of that. And then you start charging for each of those things individually. And lo and behold, I don't find anything offensive about the idea of doing it. But I think empirically, overwhelmingly likely that it ends up being considerably more expensive and people lose things that they really, really value because they can no longer afford it. And I know that there are some people for whom the license fee is a burden, but compared to how much they would have to pay if you smash it up and disaggregate it, it's a real, real bargain. I would remind you again, £157.50 expressed as a lump sum, not negligible. Expressed as per week, not so much. Expressed as per day, absolutely fantastic bargain. Right, let's move on to Liam Halligan. Liam, do you think the BBC is in peril? What would you recommend that should be in the intro of the, of the next Director General? Thank you, Ian, and, and thank you to the, the organisers for inviting me, and congratulations to everybody who's written a chapter for this important uh, new book. So I'm a, I'm a BBC outsider. I've, I've um, applied for BBC jobs and not got them. I've turned down BBC jobs that I've been offered, uh, but I grew up in a house with no books, and I care about the BBC profoundly. It had a huge impact on my life. It helped me believe somebody from a non-professional background with no media connections could become a national journalist. I feel today's BBC gives off a bit of a different vibe. We've seen a lot of good improvements in gender and ethnic diversity, but when it comes to diversity and socioeconomic background and outlook of those <coughs> we hear from on the BBC, particularly in news and current affairs, I'd say we've lost serious ground. That's one reason why I agree with my former FT colleague, Ray Snoddy, who says in this new book that the depth and range of current animosity towards the BBC appears unprecedented in his view. I want, like everybody on this uh, call, for the BBC to survive and thrive, but it desperately needs to change and the boss class need to acknowledge and embrace that need to change and start to shape it. In the new book, the distinguished historian Jean Seaton, she's right to say the BBC makes public space of our national imaginations bigger and more generous, but only up to a point because sometimes, particularly in recent years, I think the BBC's limited our national imaginations. I think it's just foisted on licence fee payers a definitive BBC view of the world that millions of people from all political parties and none view as naive and woefully, frankly, out of touch. I also disagree most respectfully with, with Jean Seaton that the BBC is, in her view, an always reformable institution. From where I stand, somebody with many, many good friends inside the BBC, countless conversations over many years, it's a sprawling, bloated bureaucracy that resists change to, uh, to as much as it can. Uh, it's very, and that very resistance, in my view, is what's put in the BBC's existence and potentially existence, but certainly its future in peril. Now, one prominent BBC presenter says in the book 
that any de- well, any serious departure from the status quo would be, quote, an act of mindless self-harm, a phrase we've heard used in a different context in recent years. But that view simply ignores the real world of shifting public attitudes as expressed in the parliamentary arithmetic, but more fundamentally, the shifting digital world, because streaming and subscription technology are to broadcasting what the motor car was to the horse. The license fee in its current form is already way past its sell by date. I think the BBC needs to acknowledge that front and center. And anyone who waves away the need for genuine restructuring, genuine restructuring the BBC, desperate for Johnson and his nasty advisors to come unstuck, they need to understand that this new technology, it's not gonna be uninvented. It's getting more ubiquitous. It's becoming more entrenched all the time. It won't fall foul of a tabloid scandal. It won't be unelected. And so historically, the BBC's best argument has been high levels of public trust. Unfortunately, those trust levels are falling, typically around 70% during my lifetime. It's now less than 50% in January. Uh, uh, And it it seems that less than half of the BBC, of the public trust the BBC, we won't get up to those historically high levels again. Of course, the corporation's imbued with a a metropolitan liberal outlook out of touch with vast sways of the country. That's completely obvious. Many people don't only feel unrepresented by the BBC, they feel patronised. That's reflected in this view in who the BBC employs, who it promotes, the output it delivers, particularly to our TV screens and particularly in news and current affairs. And at this point, I could quote many former very senior BBC people who have said roughly that one of whom is on this call and it isn't me or Ed Wiener. Of course, the safe middle ground during the referendum on Scottish independence and Brexit disappeared because a Brexit, a referendum is a binary choice. Um, uh, I think actually during those referenda, as I said, the BBC did quite a good job of being even handed, albeit under electoral law. But I think after 2016, when much of the political media establishment rallied to reverse the the Brexit result, but the BBC made serious mistakes. It didn't simply it simply didn't understand how outrageous much of the country thought that that was. Leavers and remainers alike to try and reverse a referendum. And as John Humphrey said, BBC bosses were devastated by the victory of the Leave campaign. I'm not sure the BBC as a whole has ever quite had a real grasp of what was going on in Europe or of what people in this country thought about it, said John, who, of course, famously voted Remain. It's certainly been my overwhelming impression, not just from watching, but also doing a fair bit of BBC punditry since mid-2016, that I've I've appeared on countless BBC panels, and I've generally been the sole leave voter out of four or five, almost always, um, where, you know, I was the person defending a national referendum where the majority was bigger than the population of Birmingham, our second city, And yet I was constantly made to feel, and I can look after myself in a studio, as Ian will tell you, I was constantly made to feel marginalised by presenters, unrepresented, uh, unrepresentative and extreme. And of course, the Ofcom board rejected countless accusations of anti-Brexit bias. Um, But the Ofcom board is packed with BBC insiders, (laughs) nine out of the 12 current Ofcom content board members. And the public gets that. And it's patronising to think. Okay, Liam, I need to... I need you to wrap up in a second. Sure, sure. So my view is that the, 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 this, what we've got now is a heady post-Brexit review, uh, brew of intense paranoia inside uh, the BBC uh, and dangerous uh, political spite uh, within the government. So the, the unavoidable negotiations that we need to have are starting off in a dangerous place and cultural and media assets of huge value, which taxpayers have invested in for many years and which are bound up with the identity of this country are in grave danger to say nothing uh, uh, of public trust. So honest, cool debate is required. Wise heads needs to prevail. And I'd say above all, BBC insiders need to seek the help of critical friends, understanding how they appear from the outside to many million. Yeah, I need you to finish. And grasping the serious weakness and limitations of some of their in-house views. Thank you. Well, talking of wide heads, let's go to Roger Mosey for the first question to Liam Halligan. Well, even as a Remain voter myself, I, I do sympathise with what you say you about, about, about the politics. I, I just wonder, though, what, what you said towards the end about the spite within the government. I and mean, would you agree that the 
worst people to reform the BBC now are some of the people currently in government. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it like that. I mean, I'd, I'd be a lot more politically pragmatic about it. We are where we are. I mean, during the ref, the, the post uh, Brexit uh, uh, political developments, not during the campaign, when I th- I've said on record many times that I thought the BBC did well during the campaign, but afterwards, a lot of senior BBC people on and off screen, they seem to bet the ranch on a second referendum. They seem to lose any sense of even trying to look um, impartial. Uh, and the people that you took on, politicians and campaigners alike, they now hold the levers of power with a majority, and that is the reality. So we should think less about what we think of them. They are there, and they have the public's backing for now, and they're not going away for a long time, and the technology that is driving this debate is not going away either. So for that reason, I think, uh, as Fiona Chesterton said at the beginning, I think it was well put, the BBC needs to acknowledge, as Mark Damaser just kindly did, that there does need to be serious change, that the licence fee will shrink and people like you, Roger, like you, Mark, ex-BBC people, wise heads, the rest of us who are amongst the broadcasting establishment need to come up with shared revenue models that will allow a kind of hybrid BBC to protect those crown jewels of public service broadcasting. I agree with everything you say, that there's a lot more strength and vitality in public service broadcasting, but it's not going to come from, frankly, a regressive poll tax that is the source of one in 10 court cases in this country. Boris is a moderate, pragmatic politician. You might not like him, but any objective science uh, observer of politics would say that. He has many advisors, not just one. Uh, Sure, Downing Street want to put, you know, they want to scare new broadcasting house to soften you up before the negotiation. But there are many other people in and around government that Boris listens to who have a much more a moderate, less spiteful sense um, of how the BBC should be reformed. Well, that, that's an interesting point, because when Edwina was speaking, in fact, when Mark, one of you was talking about Strictly Come Dancing, the thought went through my head, well, it would be a very brave politician who put in their manifesto, uh, we're going to take Strictly Come Dancing away from you. Um, Mark Damaser, a question for Liam. I would say something because I'm in a minority of one really on the editorial stuff. I am aware of confirmation bias. I'm aware I may have it. My confirmation bias wouldn't be Remain v Brexit. It would be BBC versus not BBC and whether the BBC is an impartial broadcaster. And I think that it is. Um, The trust figures that have been banded around in the last hour, uh, there are many different trust figures. But I would say this to Liam, turn it into the form of a question. Why is this mildly sclerotic lumbering, slow to change, crusty, metropolitan, hidebound, narrow, elite, out of touch organization, even before COVID, easily the most trusted news organization in every poll except one in the last 10 years, now very much so during COVID. Why does it have all of this audience affection? Why is it still consumed by so many people? Why even under the age of 35, where the BBC has a real problem we've not much touched on here, which reflects our demographic, why is it still the biggest media provider for under 35s? What's so hopeless about it? That it has all these people who still, even if they don't say that they love it all the time, clearly love it some of the time, uh, and watch it and listen to it and consume it online. Why is it that invented the iPlayer? What is this organization? I don't recognize it. It's got a ton of problems. It will need to change. It has changed. The current license fee model is probably no longer sustainable. But all of this is doom, gloom, and not based on empirical evidence. Well, uh, you're you're right to defend the BBC as we approach the 100th anniversary, uh, and the public will rightly hear over the next 12 to 18 months of a lot of great BBC things that we've enjoyed over many generations. These, These are very, very important cultural assets. But look, I'm not doom and glooming. This isn't doing my career any good being here. I'm trying to convey the idea that there are lots of very sane, knowledgeable people out there who think the BBC desperately needs to change. In fact, know that it has to change. And all we ever get from BBC types is just endless um, rebuffing and, and failure to admit that there needs to be change. You did admit to me that there needs to be a smaller license fee, but only after I asked you a question. It wasn't I didn't say it's small. I said there shouldn't, I'm not sure that I'm paying the license fee at all. I said, I said flat in real terms. I'm not voting for cuts. Yeah. Uh, I also don't buy, as it were, Fiona's thesis that people are bound to want to spend less money 
on entertainment in the future. They may or they may not. I actually think they'll be going out much less, both for health and safety reasons and also economic reasons. And so what they consume in their home may become more valuable to them and they may value the BBC more and not less. I think when the, it's, it's great that the BBC is enjoying a wave of publicity, but I think as Fiona said, I think she's right. You shouldn't think that this is gonna reverse, this isn't a new normal. When the nation gets up off its collective sofa and gets a lot busier, then those eyeballs simply won't be captive. Uh, so um, you do need to sure, you need sure, Liam, But you'll, you'll still be left with what I think is your problem here. And in, indeed Edwina's problem too, which is I know that it's declining. And I know over the next four or five years, that figure of 92, 93% reach and the average consumption of 18 hours, go figure, 18 hours per person um, will decline somewhat. All I can guarantee you is that if you deprive it of money and you keep on lashing it, against improbable standards um, uh, with multiple grumbles without realizing that Britain consists of people with multiple tastes and your grumble isn't shared by everybody else. If that's the way the BBC is going to be treated in the public debate, then I can guarantee you the BBC will do less well than it's doing now. What I'm saying is that it's doing well enough for lots of different reasons, including talent, including tradition, including history, including COVID, including news and current affairs, including comedy, including radio, that it deserves on merit, on empirical evidence merit, to continue to be well resourced. It's no, only no the one here is to be scrapped. Liam, 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 Liam we, need to, we need to move on to the last section of um, what we're doing here today. And we've got a few questions coming from people who are watching. Um, somebody wants to know who you all think should be the new Director General. Now there's a poison chalice of a question to answer, but let's combine it with another one. Um, Peter Bennett-Jones, who some of you may know, says, is the D job too too big for one person should it be split roger mosey let's start with you well i'll answer the second one first i i think you do need a team and i thought it was very effective when mark thompson and mark byford were in harness with mark looking after journalism and mark doing the other mark doing the big strategy so i think there is an argument that especially um depending on who the dg is to have a complementary person as a ddg or as part of the team um, as for people, uh, just don't do that, okay? I, I, it would be the kiss of death anyway, but I, I'm not going to start tipping people. Is that because, I mean, you, you and Mark have both been associated with the job in, in, in the past. If someone came knocking at your door now, I mean, I, I guess the application process is actually all, all underway already. But do, do you regret that you never got the top job? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I, I think I think it's a bed of nails. I think it's an extraordinarily difficult job to do. And and if you look at BBC DGs over over the years, I mean, the person I have an unfashionable um, um, fondness for is is John Burt, who I think had the strategic vision for the BBC that was extraordinary. And actually, on Edwina's point, he 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 really spotted the digital age and the internet way before other broadcasters. I mean, BBC News uh, was launched online, uh, you know, had first mover advantage and, and a fantastic, and to some extent now, when you're looking at the media world, I mean, Fiona talked about BBC Premier, I think that was an idea that John Burt was looking at in 1995. So I think you need someone with that big strategy grasp, but also someone who can really um, okay. you know, get the editorial wheels whirring and get really great content. Um, Edwina Curry, what kind of person, if you, I mean, I suspect several of you are going to be reluctant to name names, but what kind of person do you think the BBC needs? Somebody who is intimately involved with the BBC at the moment, or somebody who's going to come in from the outside and maybe a, a complete change maker? Well, it could well be that it has to be somebody from outside, not least because, uh, you know, listening to what Mark was saying, if you're only ever arguing for the status quo, you're going to fail. You may fail slowly, but you will fail. And that would be a, a, a great shame. An enormous amount would be, uh, would be lost. Um, Roger was the person that introduced me to Radio 5 Live. And he will recall that Radio 5 Live was set up because during the first Iraq war, it suddenly, suddenly dawned on the BBC that nobody in this country was providing 24-hour uh, news coverage. And that we were all watching CNN. And hey presto, Radio 5 uh, started. And based up here in the north, it doesn't get anything like the criticism that BBC News based in London gets because you've got local accents, you've got local experts and so on. Um, whoever it is, 
I would say can't believe that the BBC is a religious institution because it isn't. Um, it, it often seems to me the BBC feels a bit like the Church of England did 200 years ago. That it's the only thing that exists, that it's the only organisation that carries the truth and that it must be supported by tithes on the people. Well, you know what? A hell of a lot of people are dissenters to that and resent it. And uh, if you, we've got to get through Catholic emancipation and a few other bits and bobs before we find that actually the BBC is su succeeding in a secular world. It's a tough world out there. You will have to compete. Whoever it is has to be starting from that viewpoint, but also from the viewpoint of wanting the highest integrity in all the public service side of what the BBC does so well. Mark Amazon. Well, um, uh, what should change and what shouldn't? I mean, of course, the BBC um, hasn't changed the whole time. It couldn't be remotely. Well, no, 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 no. The, the question is about the job of director general. Is it too big for one person and who would you like to get it? Or what kind oh, of person? Is, it would probably like is too big for one person, but it needs to be done by one person. I mean, the buck needs to stop somewhere on editorial decisions. There has to be a director general who has an editorial in chief kind of mode of thought. Um, it's quite cute to think that you can divide the strategy from the editorial uh, and the business of managing the business from the business of making decisions and commissioning and in fact solving Edwina's first question of the day, which is how do you allocate scarce resources between competing interests, those interests being the audience interests rather than just the producer interests and for that you need somebody of real clout and heft. Um, rather like Roger, you wouldn't remotely tempt me into iniquity by benighting somebody by suggesting a name. Um, it's a very, very tough job. It's a sort of bed of nails, but there are harder jobs um, in the world than being Director General of the BBC. Um, many of them are considerably less well paid than being Director General of the BBC, and it is a privilege. I mean, people should be paid for it. I'm not thinking it's for charity, but it's a wonderful institution. And to be at the head of it is a wonderful opportunity, which comes with an awful lot of pain. Um, but an awful lot of reward. So um, the answer is that there will be a very strong field and I'm sure they'll pick somebody and I'm sure that somebody will try to live up to the BBC's highest standards. Um, can I ask if you have applied? You may ask and I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> um, Liam Halligan, one name occurs to me because everybody's being slightly reluctant to uh, often. Somebody some, somebody who ha is, has worked for the BBC, but knows about the media. Um, what would you think of a director general called Andrew Neil? Well, he's, I think he's very widely respected across the country by people of all parties and none as a very forensic interviewer. Um, he's somebody who I've worked with in, in the past. Uh, he, he's, uh, he gives me a nice puff on the cover of my latest book. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, and, and he also, as well as having... He's a shoe in then. Yeah, as well as a lot of political and economic knowledge, he also, un, unusually among sort of media executives in the UK, has proper business experience. I mean, this is the bloke who, who very much drove the launch of Sky News, um, and anybody who reads his um, biography, Full Disclosure, there's a, a great deal there about um, the, the business of, of media. Um, I don't think he'd want it. I, I would like to see between the BBC DG and the chairman, at least one, possibly both of them, should be genuine outsiders of the B, from the BBC, though friends of the BBC, and maybe one should come from a completely non-broadcast background. But above all, they need to be intellectually omnivorous. Look, post-Brexit, levelling up, this was always going to be the biggest moment of sort of policy upheaval in the UK since Thatcher. Now we've got COVID on top of that. We're in a kind of new <laughs> Jerusalem. We're in a kind of post-1945 situation where policy is going to be extremely fluid and the whole country is going to have a stake in building an, a new way forward. And you, we're going to stay with capitalism, but it's going to be a new form of capitalism. It's going to be policy renewal. During that period, BBC News and Current Affairs in particular has an enormously important role to play and it's vital they bring in people who, who swim in different waters to most of the BBC news and current affairs types. And for that to happen, you're going to need somebody at the top, DG, chairperson, hopefully both, who's got the kind of clout to make that happen. Because that will be fiercely resisted 
within the BBC. A lot, of, a lot of jealousies, a lot of people have got their patches that they want to cover, but it's vital if we're going to maintain public trust in the BBC, which I desperately want to do, um, that we have uh, the BBC playing a really major and constructive uh, as well as critical part in this huge policy debate that we're going to see in the UK but over the next five to ten years. It isn't the problem with somebody who comes completely from outside the BBC, the fact that inevitably it's going to take them, it's a bit like when you're appointed to a new cabinet post, you spend the first year reading yourself in, getting used to the subject, because most of the time you're not an expert in it. You have one year to make an impact and then, then, then you're out again. Now, if you come in with no inside knowledge of the BBC at all, that is a very steep learning curve for someone from outside, isn't it? It is, but one of the great strengths of the BBC, and I'm lucky to have known a lot of them over the years, and again, reading Roger's book really brings that home to non-broadcasting people. The BBC does have a, 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 a raft of very strong upper management below the DG, reporting to the DG, who basically, you know, make the thing run from day to day. What's really, really important, you know, the new DG, they're not going to be fixing the coffee maker and getting an edit suite and telling people what's wrong with their films. Um the strategy role, the clear sightedness, the ability to manage what will be a fraught relationship, not just with the government, but also with other broadcasters as we move to a more hybrid model and with the public. These communication skills, these business skills, this ability to think strategically, it sounds a cliche, but they're going to be absolutely vital to securing the future of a smaller BBC that does less, but does it better. Final question to each of you, almost a yes, no answer if you can, maximum 30 seconds. Um, we're, we're in 2027, and do you think the DG of the time, because it may be the same one that's about to be appointed, but who knows, do you think the DG of the time will be presiding over an organisation that is funded by primarily a licence fee at that point, Edwina Curry? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, but I think the, they're on notice. They're on notice. It can't last forever. I think it will be decriminalised. OK, um, Mark? Uh, it may not be a licence fee. Uh, it ought to and will be funded by large sections of the population, almost all of the population, who will all rightly continue to feel that it's theirs. Roger. Uh, I agree with Mark. Leo. I also, I also agree with Mark. I'm not ideological or binary about this. I do think the BBC will move to a model where it has many sources of, of, of funding, a subscription, some advertising, selling formats, which it makes brilliantly around the world. You know, it's got an archive that Netflix would die for that's massively valuable that it's starting to exploit now. But I think unless we get the funding, uh, the state direct, the, 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 the government subsidy uh, below 50%, then the culture of the institution won't change and it will remain statist and bureaucratic to the detriment of uh, commerce and creativity. Well, thank you to all four of you. And thanks to everyone who's been watching. Edwina Curry, Roger Mosey, Mark Damaza, and Liam Halligan. And thanks to John Mayer, who's organised this and made sure, made sure that we're all here on time. And hopefully the technology has worked. Let me also give a plug to the book that we've been referring to. It's called Is the BBC in Peril? Does it deserve to be? Uh, it is available on Amazon. But given that I used to be an independent bookseller, I would urge you to order it from your local independent bookshop because, boy, do they need the business at the moment and also if you've enjoyed the last hour please put it on your social media feeds and put the youtube link so more people can watch us thank you very much goodbye